Carlo. Good morning. Hello. Welcome to the Music in Schools conference here at the wonderful Music Works in Gloucester. Uh, my name's Chris Halpin, aka Diskinetic, um, and I'm come here to talk to you about my adventures as a disabled musician. You may have lots of questions about what I'm wearing. Um, it's nice. I made it myself. Oh, the, the gloves, yeah. We'll talk about the gloves in a moment, actually. I'll keep you in suspense a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Cool. Hopefully there's loads of questions. Um, so, my journey as a disabled musician, as I say, my name is Chris Halpin, a.k.a. Diskinetic, and nowadays, um, spoiler alert, it's going really well. Frankly, I've been everywhere. It's been really exciting. It was going less well, so I don't always feel like it's useful to ex talk about diagnosis with young people, but I think it's relevant here. So I have CP, and as a young musician, um, well, as a young person, faced a lot of barriers. I grew up in a very tiny little village in the middle of nowhere, somewhere near Birmingham, and um, as if the silly accent didn't give it away. And I, despite facing quite a lot of barriers to moving around and all that sort of stuff, I still kind of knew what I wanted to do at the ripe old age of about four or five, that I was going to be a famous rock star, of course. Uh, my dad was in bands and stuff, so there's kind of that was the kind of reference point. Um, my journey through school and music education was pretty bumpy, actually. I was um, excluded. Uh, we talk about, like nowadays, they talk a lot about the medical model and the social model of disability, which I'll get into in a little bit, hopefully, this morning. Um, one of the things that I faced was like, so I have a hand impairment on this side, which affects my ability to access traditional instruments. I always wanted to play the piano, and I had a few piano lessons at school, but it was very much like, after a while, it was like, well, you can't really do this, can you? So you need to go and do something else. And I was excluded from music quite a lot, despite the fact that it was um, all I wanted to do. I was actually quite fortunate, in a weird way, uh, my impairment had progressed to a point where I couldn't get up, there was no elevator in my school at the time. So I couldn't access um, most of the building, literally. So I was effectively put in isolation for my GCSEs, which sounds super weird now I say it out loud, but there you go. Um, the only subject that was taught on the ground floor was music. I think my life would be quite different if that wasn't the case, but I was excluded from lessons with a very medical model approach of like, you know, I was in one-on-one -on -one lessons, because, oh, well, you can't do this because of your hand. But nevertheless, I built a reasonably full career as a musician in my 20s and 30s, um, and things were going quite well for me, or starting to go quite well for me. Um, I was playing in bands, and I had a, a single out that was starting to do okay on BBC Six Music, and all that kind of stuff was happening. And at the same time, my impairment had progressed quite sort of suddenly. They tell you that CP isn't progressive, but I think the wear and tear of what happens to your body when you have a condition like CP um, is progressive. And I was going out playing gigs, I was still one of them, you know, like dudes with an acoustic guitar, you know, all pouring out my feelings in A minor kind of guy before all this technology came along. And I was finding it increasingly hard because of my hand impairment. I'd always struggled with guitar and I'd always struggled, struggled with access barriers to venues and things, all the cool places to play in Birmingham or upstairs above some cool place or whatever. Um, there's a lot of attitudinal barriers of like people just being like, well, you can't. You're disabled. You can't make. You're not. Gonna, you can't be successful. You need to think of something else to do. Um, but then I was facing this additional barrier of a hand impairment and not even being able to access the instrument that I was playing. And it sounds really dramatic now, but I kind of felt like my career was kind of coming to a close because I was like, well, if I can't play live, I can't perform. What am I going to do? I certainly didn't know anything about other ways to play music, but it seemed a bit silly. I thought, well. Okay, as I've mentioned, I grew up in the middle of nowhere, so I was kind of a token disabled kid at my school, but I didn't... Um, I thought, well, that's, there must be other disabled musicians, there must be other young people facing barriers to music. Um, so I went to the Twitter, as you do, and everyone kept saying to me, you need to talk to Drake Music. They're a charity in London who do amazing work through technology. Some of you may have heard of them. And this is going back about, I don't know, seven or eight years now. Um, so I reached out to Drake Music, and they were really the first organization that kind of recognized me as being in, you know, they saw what I was doing as being really good. 
and they were really supportive of my music and they wanted to help me. And um, I started playing around with accessible technology as it was at that time, it's about you know, seven or eight years ago. And I've come, my, I've come full circle with my attitudes towards accessible technology, but someone outside of the sector coming to this stuff for the first time, I, I thought it was rubbish. I was like, oh, okay, so I could play like a, a major scale, I could move my hand in front of a light and, you know, for some context, when I was a teenager, I wanted to be, an obscure reference, but I wanted to be Steve Vai. So the idea of like playing a C major scale with a light, I was like, oh, okay, I don't really know if I can work with this. Um, at the same time that I was having this conversation with Drake Music, Drake Music were talking to uh, an amazing singer-songwriter, Grammy award-winning genius called Imogen Heap. I don't know if anyone's heard of Imogen Heap. Cool. So Imogen was trying to solve, entirely separately of all this, she was trying to solve a different problem that she was facing to music making, which was that she makes electronic music, and she was doing a lot of stuff with, uh, as she put it, you know, she, you're watching a woman singing with a laptop. And for all you know, she's checking her emails. Like, you don't know where the, right? You don't know where the sound is coming from. You don't know why, or the audience isn't let into how the electronic music comes to exist. And she wanted a new gestural way to create music. She'd seen a demonstration at MIT of a data glove, and she thought that a musical glove could be the solution. So she put together an amazing team. Literally, people came from NASA and University of West England. Rachel, who's the seamstress who makes these, she works on a lot of Marvel movies and things. She's like a major. She just, Imogen brought the, the best of the best together to realize this vision of a wearable glove. Gowan Hewitt at Drake Music, this glo oh, glove, saw this glove, and he, he was like, okay, there's something in this, quite by accident, had Imogen invented a breakthrough bit of accessible tech. An instrument that uses artificial intelligence to learn the user. This is a complete inverse of the medical model problem of the teacher saying, oh, you can't play this instrument because... You're, you've got a hand impairment. It's my problem. That's a medical model attitude. It's, my, it's for me to change. Can you get physio or something? Is there some way you can access the piano that way? This completely turned that concept on its head. It was a social model instrument. The instrument learns the user. Suddenly, any movement could be valid and be musical. And that was a real breakthrough in terms of just the thinking that Imogen had not thought about doing, but quite by accident had maybe discovered. So. I went along to Imogen's and met her, and I'm a big fan of her music, so that was quite exciting, of course. Um, and we talked about the possibility of me using the Mimi gloves, and I had a little go. And I'm going to show you, just sort of re try and rewind and sort of talk about why I was excited about using them, just as soon as I've dealt with this email. <laughs> See, you're awake. You're awake. Um, it's going to crash. It's going to crash. I'm really sad. I just got one of those fancy new M1 Mac Pros, and it sat on my desk at home because I just didn't have time to put all the gubbins that you need to do this. So I'm rocking this positively vintage 2018 MacBook Pro over here, which is about to fall apart, I think. Um, oh, no, it didn't. Yeah, so my sort of musical imagination at the time I was just like a guitar dude, but then I was doing a lot of production in the box, in, uh, you know, using technologies like Logic and stuff and things that you will be familiar with that you nowadays find in things like GarageBand. But I was like, well, could I bring those sounds to my live, live stage? And the first thing I did actually was not have any sound. Um, Whoa, that's some sound. Is that maybe a bit loud? I don't know. Is that too loud? It's for these good people to decide, I guess. Like, I go to the gym and stuff, so the first thing I ever did when I tried out the gloves was like... But then the idea... I'm going to stand up now. That annoys them insane, supposed to tell you. They'll be like, <laughs> do you need that chair or not, mate? Like, all right, chill out. I can walk a bit. It's not like a 
Complete. If they think if you can stand up, you can run a marathon. Um, cool. Sorry, I really look like I'm checking emails. I'm terrible at this today. Um, right, okay, drums work. So what if I was to... I was just thinking about, like, you've all seen live looping and stuff, right? So I started thinking, well, could I live loop with all the sounds that I normally use in the studio? Could I get it in time? That's the clever bit. Maybe I could use the technology to... Maybe I could just fix it with some clever trickery that you didn't even notice. It's like magic, isn't it? Um, but then I was like playing the dr I was doing that, I was like, okay, so I can have drums for the first time in my live show. But the big barrier was like the back to the piano lessons, was like I couldn't, there's so many ideas I had as a composer with the piano, that I just couldn't do. I could never move this hand especially to play the arpeggios and the ideas that I had. But then I thought, well, what if I could turn like a simple gesture, get the gloves to learn something from me that I could do that was simple enough and then play something much more complicated. That's a really complicated way of explaining this. that really is real. He says optimistically. Make sense? <laughs> and now it's gone. Look at that. It's disappeared. It's all sleight of hand. Um, yeah, so that's one of the cool things about this controller is I've, like, you have these scenes, so I can, I'm just going off on a tech tangent here, because if you might have questions about the tech, feel free to interrupt me with the questions. Um, now you have a thing called scenes, and we can, like, I can build a controller. This isn't there anymore, because I got rid of it when I did a thing, right? So you can map something and go, this is my interface, and then you can get rid of it and bring in another one for another part of the song. Like literally any movement that you can replicate with your hands um, can be any sound. And of course, any the fact that you can use any movement really means for someone like myself, like my impairment is quite sort of variable at times. So like, for example, this is kind of detail stuff, but my ability to make a fist can vary from day to day. So if that's a good, strong, tight fist one day and that's a bit loose another day, I'll just tell it that's what I mean when I'm telling you that it's a fist. 
So it learns me, I don't learn the instrument. Still with me? Cool. Um, I'm conscious of time, I'm conscious of the fact that we started a little bit later. We've got five minutes. Do you want me to play like one more thing? Okay, so um, let me just pull in this piece. So yeah, to say that my career took a, it sounds awfully dramatic when I say that I felt like I was on the scrappy before all this started, but I did an interview with Wired magazine, which turned into a three-page spread about my journey as a disabled musician with the gloves. That was before I'd even opened the box. The, the excitement around this was just wild, that Imogen Heap had invented this thing and it was going to be used in this new way. Um, yeah, so I went from like not, it all sounds like I'm really boasting, but I think it's important that people got to see a disabled mus musician do as much stuff as I've done. I've been, I did a tour that was meant to run for like a week in the UK in 2016, and that tour ended 18 months later on the main stage at the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, the following summer. Like, the phone just didn't stop ringing. People went, we need to see this, this is a thing. But it mattered. Not only was it, I mean, it's cool for me, right? Like, flying around the world and playing loads of gigs. I went to Tokyo in 2019. It's great, but if just one musician is like having a good time, well, kind of, so what? The, the important bit, it doesn't matter that I'm doing well, what matters is that it has a degree of impact. It's not about me, I came to learn pretty quickly. It's about what audiences see reflected in what's happening and what I'm doing. And it's not just about other disabled musicians, because everyone has, well, a lot of people certainly have a connection to disability, they have a disability story. I remember one of the first big gigs I did, a security guard coming up to me at the end, he was like tears in his eyes saying, I've been filming this on my phone because my nephew's got CP and I just can't wait to show him what you're doing. And it was um, a big deal, a big old deal. It mattered to a lot of people. Um, I guess it still does. And so one of the things I did, I'm going to play you one last piece of music. Um, <clears throat> Come on. Yeah, cool. Um, so when I went to Japan in 2019, this was a piece of music that I created for that trip. Um, I was really fascinated by the piano works. Excuse me, I'm just going to discreetly slap some water. Without you hearing it, that's good. that takes skill. I promise you. That's harder than this. Um, so... Uh, I was really obsessed with Ryoichi Sakamoto and those kind of piano works, and I wanted to do this kind of piece where I had this vision of this piece that progressed from this piano work that I couldn't play into this heavy metal kind of thing that I certainly couldn't play because there was too much dexterity and too many instruments, for one thing. Um, so this is that piece of music, and I sort of took... I guess it's like um, a really convenient sort of show and tell because it's crammed absolutely jam-packed with all the glove tricks. Um, so here it is, this is called Koino Yokan. Set forwards. I have to tell it where you are so it knows that, what, does that make sense? Yeah, right. You can ask questions later, I'm sure it's super confusing in a way.
Thank you. Um, we're probably out of time for this section. Maybe a quick question, if there is one. Um, But yeah, thank you. People, Chris Halpin, massive round of applause, Bill. <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. Does anyone have a question for Chris? Yes, Pete Sent. Cool. I'm here all day. Find me if there's more. Necessarily, no. It rely there's there's timing to it. If that's what you if you're talking about, it's not like a preloaded mic. That's a chord. That's a chord. But at the point where I move into it, that becomes a chord. Is that what you're thinking? It's not a sort of sequence of like clips and things that are just kind of coming in. Like there's a degree of yeah. It doesn't quant. It's quantize a better word. Yeah. It doesn't quantize. Um, what I'm doing. It re still requires you to have a degree of timing. I think one of the things that was exciting about it, I've got a few little tricks. You saw me play that loop and it didn't quite time right, but I have a way of going, quantizing it with that little thing there that I do. So I could do that after the fact. One of the things that was really exciting about this instrument when we started this project was that Gowan at Drake Music said it was the first bit of accessible tech that he saw that had scope for virtuosity. It, was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like a... My frustration with iPads and stuff was it's a binary event of just pressing a button, it's on or it's off. This, you can get good at this and you can, you know, I'm hopefully a better player of, at this after five years of doing it than I was when I started. Yeah, so it's... Does that make it more confusing? Probably. <laughs> Brilliant. Should we take two more questions? Anyone else? Yes, Pip. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, no, you absolutely could perform with other people. And we've, uh, Imogen and I were the first people to do a gig together where it was like two people playing two pieces, you know, together uh, on stage as kind of an ensemble, or at least a duo. Um, yeah, it certainly does. Uh, I do solo stuff for lots of reasons. Uh, I'm a greedy pig and I want complete control over everything. Um, touring is cheaper on your own, there's that. Um, and the other first bit was where do I see it going? Um, well, I'd like, obviously, as many young people as possible who face similar barriers that, that... Well, I used to think in terms of just similar barriers. I'd like those young people to see it and have access to this technology. But I've learned with the young people that I've worked with that it isn't necessarily... I only thought about this in terms of hand impairments. Like, I've worked with people... I worked with a young person who is on the autism spectrum, faced no physical barrier to music making, but faced a lot of barriers to music making nonetheless. And... I was working with him and he tried the gloves and his mum burst into tears. She was like, I've never seen him like this before because he was throwing these big shapes and playing all this music. And I realised, oh, it's not just about hand impairments. And that was a learning curve for me because the, it invites you to play music in a way that I think there's kind of these rules about a traditional instrument. My partner wouldn't go near a piano because she perceives herself to be not a musician. But this opens up a, a different way of you know, bringing gesture and physical movement to music making. So, yeah. The potential is huge, and I'd like to see... I'd love to wave my magic, magic wand and let, make every, sure every school and every hub's got ten pairs, and maybe one day I'll be that wealthy. Lovely. Hey. Um, yeah, I guess, obviously, from a performance point of view, it's super accessible and it's really inclusive. How would you say on the back end, because there must be so much going on technologically to get the input bit going <laughs> Yeah. I think you could get something. No, it's it's quite nicely wrapped up in a in a front end bit of software called Glover, which is just the application that comes with the Mimu gloves, and then that just sends MIDI. It's just 
all it is is a graphical programming interface that just says, on one hand, you've got inputs. I'm going to do this. I want you to send this chord out. And then I, I happen to use Ableton Live. I'm just a big fan of that. You could use anything, GarageBand, Logic, whatever. It's just kicking out MIDI. I mean, when I did that first bit of boxing drumming, the first time I put the gloves on, I mean, that was like a matter of a, a minute or two to work out how to do that. And then the, the clever bit is it just gets more and more complex as your ambitions and your imagination expand because you go, oh, well, what if I could have a... Viol invisible violin or I used to do this bit with like the well you saw it actually the invisible guitar bit because everyone who uses Mimi gloves was just like wait we don't know how you did that and Mimi were like we can't work out what you did but that's so cool that we don't understand because they invented it but they just you you just piece the puzzle together and go well if I could do this what else could I do and it get yeah the fun bit is it gets super complicated it doesn't need to be super complicated but I'm not going to lie the stuff I'm doing is definitely super complicated because that's what I do. But yeah, it has, it's a funny curve, that one. So yeah, my name's Dan. I am head of music at a Bristol school uh, called Bristol Free School. Um, the reason I'm here is because we were contacted through the hub to get someone kind of external to Gloucestershire to come and talk about inclusive music, about how we can make sure that music is really inclusive for all the young people living in Gloucestershire and that's something that I'm really really passionate about and I think my kind of journey in uh, in in how I've become and worked as a head of music hopefully can share as we were just told some ideas to get us talking really so I started at the Bristol Bristol Free School when it first opened so it was a brand new school in a car park with just a little temporary classroom and you know there was about 10 staff so it's really really tiny and I'd only just done my teacher training so I was completely brand new to the job had no idea when I took the job that I was going to be actually setting up a music department by myself quickly realized that was quite terrifying and and over the years of having done that I've been there for about 10 years now I've learned a lot along the way and made loads of mistakes and tried things in certain different ways and they haven't quite worked um, and hopefully by sharing some of those ideas it can get us thinking about um, about inclusive music so I wanted to start with just a little bit of um an introduction to me as a teenager, all right? So I was a teenager um, when, I, when I was at school. This is, this is me trying to look as cool as I possibly could um, when I was at school. And I was obsessed with music. I absolutely loved it. It was, you know, I, if I was answering that question about is music the most important thing in my life, 100% yes. But when I was at school, nothing about the music provision that was given to me connected with me in any way. I was someone who was really into music production, which is what I was getting into and stuff. I, was, uh, I played a bit of piano. I, was, uh, I, I bought some decks and was a bedroom DJ. Absolutely loved it. But music at my school felt completely disconnected from that. When I went into my Key Stage 3 music lessons, there was nothing that connected with my own music that I loved. I actually didn't do GCC music because it felt like it wasn't for me. I then went on and did uh, college later in life and got into it through a kind of different route. But I always feel like it was a shame that for someone so passionate about music, there wasn't anything for me there um, in school. And so in sort of working at setting up my own department at my school, I have sort of tried to keep in mind that kids love music. And I think that was really borne out by the statistics we just saw. I think teenagers love music and I think they get so much from it and have the capacity to love it. And I think that if a student like me at school could go through their school career feeling like music was completely not for them, despite loving it, then, then something went a little bit wrong. Um, so I think music should Education should aim to inspire all, regardless of background, prior experience, or perceived ability. We want our music education to be there for everyone in our school. Um, and music education should feel connected to students' own musical experience, but also introducing them to new things that they wouldn't have come across beforehand. So um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about how I kind of set up the curriculum at my school to see how it compares to the schools that you guys have worked at and, uh, and to get us sort of talking about it. So Key Stage 3. Key Stage 3 is like the sort of battleground of music education because it's where all of our students study. For many students, it's the only uh, music education that they will formally get in their lives in that way from a specialist music teacher. Um, we saw the statistics, 7% of, of students take music at GCSE. So for many of them, that three years at Key Stage 3, that's the music education they're getting. So there's a lot to be done there. Um, research from Ofsted um, recently has been really clear that music should be given adequate time 
time on the curriculum. Um, there was sometimes things that have been run in carousel and things where maybe there haven't been enough curriculum time. But um, I think that the new music framework and the new music curriculum have been really, really supportive of the fact that music should get adequate curriculum time. And it makes you think, like, what's this for then? So if we've got these three years of Key Stage 3, what are we going to do uh, with these students? And I kind of thought what I, what I really wanted to do was to make sure that every student can consider themselves a musician by the end of it with some fundamental skills that they can go on and take part in music in however they want to in their lives. And we're working with then this hugely diverse group of people, these, these students, like every young person coming through our schools. Um, and that's a huge group of, of diverse students with diverse kind of needs and, and what they're looking to get out of music. So these are some of the things that I considered going along uh, in setting up the curriculum at my school uh, related to the idea of that there's a huge diverse range of students out there. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some of those considerations. Firstly, it was about diversity of activity, about what can I do in my classroom to make sure that we've got a diverse range of activities going on. We know that music is all about compo uh, composing and appraising and performing, and we want a really balanced, uh, a practical music learning. One of the reports I read when I first started was a, a, an Ofsted report called Music Wider and Wider Still, which particularly criticised some unmusical learning going on in some classrooms. They mentioned and I'll just read you a little bit here. It says, uh, in less successful lessons, starter activities were chosen, uh, less successful because they were unmusical. Often extended spoken introductions preceded lessons which predicated non-musical activities. In these lessons, there was often little or no use of the teacher explaining and modeling the using the language of musical sound. And that resonated with me because when I was at school, I remember sitting there and doing musical maths questions and researching composers and not necessarily having musical sound as the dominant language in the class room and Ofsted were really really supportive of that having these practical sound music dominated lessons um, we don't get them for very long uh, in in one year of a key stage three lesson that equates to less than one working week for an adult so we don't get students for very long if you get one lesson a week so how part of what I'm thinking is like how can I cram as much music into that 50 minutes I get with kids a week as possible um, and Ofsted regularly mention singing and music technology as, as, as a really important part of what's happening in lessons so how can we make sure we can cram in as much uh, practical music making as possible that was one of the things that I was kind of considering another thing was about genre um, I've got a questionnaire here that was passed on through through the music works which was done about students in Gloucestershire where they were basically asked what's your favorite type of music and it kind of shows some of the things there and you can really see that like the sort of rap and associated uh, hip-hop subgenres was by far and away the dominant genre and if you can't see 56% of students saying that 37% rock and pop and then some of the other ones there having a more sort of niche listenership and it kind of said to me well you know to make music that's going to connect with young people's lives we need to think about what music they are listening to and how can we bring in this stuff that they really love and they're really excited about into our music education in school so we can feel like it connects with them. So I want to make sure that in my curriculum I've got music that connects with students' own life and musical experience as well as those music they may not have experienced otherwise. So of course we're going to introduce them to classical and jazz that hasn't got quite such a wide listenership and that's an important role of music teacher as well. There's some great stuff. I'll keep keep mentioning Ofsted and I'll tell you sort of why in a minute but there's some great stuff in the, in the most recent Ofsted research which includes examples of this like for example how can you teach about perfect cadences well the traditional way using bar chorales is great you could also use some jazz but you could even use uh, some examples from hip-hop there's an example there of a chord sequence used by um, used by the rapper Dave showing exactly the same kind of thing that you would be getting from that bar chorale so there's lots of ways that you can explore, I suppose, including the music that students are, are really excited about in your study of music theory, as well as other things. I also thought about the diversity of, like, what eras of music are we using in the classroom? You might well know about the model music curriculum that came out recently, and it's a really uh, exciting piece of uh, work that's been put together recommending all the stuff that should be going on in schools at the moment. And they've got this great list of, like, works that they think that, that, that should be studied in school. There's some really, really useful stuff on there. But I was amazed to see, as I looked down it, I was counting, and I think there was five out of the 60 pieces that were related actually came from within students' own lifetime, um, which made me think, yeah, you know, we need to be studying music that students are excited about in their own lives that are coming out now, as well as the great works of the past, which are obviously really important as well. 
Um, Featured musicians, when we feature musicians in our lessons, we are kind of subtly saying to students what is worthy of study and what is important to be doing in our lessons. There's a uh, uh, thing there from The Independent talking about dead white Germans having the lead on the classical music syllabus. Um, and it, it shows that, you know, we can be really guilty of perhaps saying, this is the important stuff, this is what you're going to tell you about, and perhaps other things we're not really going to touch on because it doesn't come into the scope of our lessons. Um, things to consider when you're featuring musicians in your lessons is, is, you know, are you getting a different range of age, gender, race, location, sexuality, disability, neurodiversity, and more? And there's some amazing uh, people doing work in this area. Chinake Orchestra do some fantastic work creating really, really diverse classical performances. Um, this is Nate Holder, who does a blog called uh, Decolonized Music Ed, which has just got some incredible resources on how to, um, you know, create, be, be featuring musicians and music that's giving a wide kind of uh, uh, look at what music is important and not subtly saying to students this is what a musician looks like and I think I'm sure we've all seen if you look for a performance of a classical piece on YouTube and you use it in a classroom the musicians tend to look a certain way maybe older white musicians tends to be the dominant feature and so this can really you know exploring these things can, can give a really great uh, uh, like picture of students seeing themselves reflected in the music that we study. Also thinking about diversity of roots into music. Many of us have learned through the sort of traditional music way of sheet music and stuff like that, but there are so many ways of learning music these days. Uh, my niece was showing me the other day that she had learned a new piece on the keyboard and she was playing it. I was like, oh, that's great. How did you learn it? And it's basically from a TikTok video where someone had put in the captions just A, F, A, A, B and had just put a string of letters and then orally then she'd copied it from the video and she's like, yeah, this is how I learned piano. I was kind of, whoa, that's crazy. That's totally, you know, different to the way that I learned. And I think that when we point students in a particular way and say this is the correct way to learn music and this is the way that isn't correct, then are we perhaps limiting ourselves? Um, prior experience, the diversity of prior experience of what we get in our schools is, is such a key part, I think, of being a music teacher. Because you've got, I think, unlike any other subject, you've got a lesson where you'll have someone sitting there who's never done any formal music education before next to someone who's just about to sit their grade four piano exam, okay? And they'll be in the same class doing the same subject. So you've got this crazy range of ability in your classes. And one of the things to consider is, am I providing challenge for all of these students? Um, this is another quote from the um, Ofsted research series talking about how overly simple or complex tasks may lead to boredom or avoidance. So that a level of challenge is what was another kind of consideration. So finally, I've talked a lot there about like the sort of considerations of how we can get a diverse music curriculum, which might help to cater for all the students that we've got in our schools. But it brings this thing of, okay, if we're doing like a whole range of different activities, a whole range of different featured styles, then perhaps you could do end up with something which as the Ofsted uh, report describes as a mile wide and an inch deep. If you try and uh, cover too much within that key stage three scope, you can find yourself not being able to do it in a huge amount of depth. And so one of the considerations in putting together a, a, a curriculum was making sure that we're looking at how the skills track over time. So, so in, in my school, we do an early introduction to keyboard skills. Then when we do chords, we're kind of building on those skills and playing chord sequences. When we do reggae, we are, although looking at a new style, really we're building those keyboard skills even further to kind of comping and syncopation, putting some melody in there. And then when we do the blues, we're looking at improvisation, we're looking at ensemble playing and two-handed playing, stuff like that. So it's, it is building skills over time rather than just being like a tour of genres where every time you're starting skills from, from scratch. So the consideration of, uh, of depth versus breadth is very important as well. Um, and finally... Staff expertise is something which can be challenging. So, you know, if I'm think, sitting there and thinking, this was me when I first started at my school, I was like, right, okay, so I want to have this really broad experience for kids. I want to be able to get them into music technology, but I also want them to be, you know, able to join an orchestra. I want to do this. And I was one person and thinking, so hang on, I have to be able to both produce an amazing hip-hop track and conduct an orchestra and lead a choir. Where do you begin with those things? And I think that in secondary schools in particular, 
we got small departments, small departments where it can be hard to, to, to kind of access all of these different skills that's required of you. I got loads and loads of help from other teachers, and that's what really, really helped me kind of in setting up a department. I went into other schools. I was lucky enough to be able to go in to other schools and work with other teachers. I also work with my music hub, and, and the music hub in Bristol is fantastic at being able to support us with saying, okay, we're going to lend you a beatboxer to come in and do a workshop for the day, or we're going to get one of our Perry teachers to come and run your string ensemble, for example. And so that was a really, really good source of support. Um, there's great stuff from the Hub, and I'd really, really recommend, I think that as a secondary school teacher, you can feel really isolated and on your own and feeling like you have to do so much. But the Hub is really there to support you and to help you with these things. So I'd really, really recommend you getting in contact with them. There's also other music of, uh, education uh, organizations out there. There's a little clip there of a great thing over lockdown that Musical Futures did where they looked at what your students are listening to. They did a great introduction to how to produce drill for uncool teachers like me. Um, and uh, that, you know, there's, there's lots of organizations doing similar stuff out there. Um, other schools, Perry teachers, parents. We've had parents run music clubs in our school before. So although it can feel like you're very much you on your own, I think by reaching out, there's, there's more that can be done as well. So that was kind of the things I was thinking of when setting up my Key Stage 3 curriculum of trying to make sure that I'm as much as possible reaching all of those kids and giving them this exciting music curriculum to study. But then I came across a problem, which is Key Stage 4. And I was going, right, so anyone can be a musician, come and pick up a guitar, let's make some hip-hop, it'll be great, blah, blah, blah. And then GCSE options, right, unless you're grade 4, you can't do it. And that's kind of what it felt like when I first started. I was there offering this GCSE course, and what it kind of equated to, I suppose, was that students coming on at the performing level, we almost had to say to them, unless you'd already started in year six playing your instrument, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to get to the point, you know, if you've just picked up your guitar in year nine and you love it, are you going to have the performing ability to sit traditional GCSE music. And that was a real problem for a while. So I started running the Adexel course, and, and that standard performing difficulty that they were doing it, as well as other, other issues with the course, meant that, um, well, I had to turn away loads of students, unfortunately, and I find myself having to like interview students for GCSE and saying, well, I'm sorry, you just haven't been playing for long enough, you can't do it. Um, and as kind of time continued, I was really looking at the courses available, and I found that some courses are much more accessible than others, basically. And, and, and trying to find a course that really fit my cohort was the, was the way that we could offer a, a diverse um, offer at Key Stage 4. What I ended up doing was petitioning the, uh, the SLT, basically. I had to have, over a couple of years, I had to talk with governors, I had to talk to SLT, and, and put forward the case for, essentially, we were lucky enough eventually to run two courses, put forward the case for, I don't want to be turning students away, I want to be able to have any student in my, uh, in my school be able to study music at Key Stage 4 if they want to. What we ended up doing was running the RSL course, which you may have heard of, RSL Music Practitioners, really accessible course. It tracks your progress from the starting point, so even a complete beginner can start and make track their progress over the year. And what it's seen is um, a really different group of kids taking music. This is my current GCSE music class. 5% of it is PP, 10% SEN. But my current, we've got about 20 kids in each class. My current um, RSL music class, the, the, um, the, the vocational course, is 50% PP kids, 35% uh, SEN, and a, and a really different mix of student backgrounds in that group. So it's a really different profile. Now, that's, I'm really fortunate to be able to do that, and there's lots of schools where I'm sure you're thinking, if I'm running two courses, are you mad? I can barely, you know, sometimes we struggle to get one class going at GCC Music. It can be really challenging. It was a lot of work to be allowed to do that, but it also just kind of made me think about really critically considering what course I was running and how I could make it work for the students I've got. I know that, for example, the Educast course has a lower um, initial sort of performing ability requirement, which can, which can be a bit more accessible. So I'd be really happy to talk about that for, for any ideas in your school if you're facing a similar problem that I was. 
Um, so, oh, there we go, I've put it on there as well. Um, so thinking about what course best provides for your cohort, and ideally, like, I, I feel lucky now that in my school I can say, if you love music, if you've really enjoyed music at Key Stage 3, you can definitely do it at Key Stage 4. And that's like, you know, I, I'm really glad that I've got to that point. It was a long battle. And if in schools you can manage to get to a similar point, then, you know, you're in a great place. Key Stage 5 is really tough, and it's a whole thing in of itself, but I'll just put one little quote on there for Key Stage 5. This is from the Ofsted recent report. It says, It's notable that the number of students taking A-level music nationally implies an average uptake of around one or two pupils per school. This means that if a normal-sized school has five pupils opting for music A-level, the cohort is over double the average. It may be helpful for senior leadership teams to know this context and plan for the likely small music classes at Key Stage 5. Um, it's always a battle. I've fought for years to try and get A-level to run, saying I've got three kids and they really, really want to do it. And they said, well, you need eight kids to run a course. And I've just said, there's no way that I'll ever get eight kids in, in our school our size. And, and messages like this from Ofsted helped to run it. And we've now got a class of four, and it's great. So um, key stage five is, I, you know, you may find that quote useful if you're doing a similar battle to me. Which leads me to the final, final kind of point, really, about getting SLT on board. Because when doing some of these things, you have to you know, sell. If you're saying, I want to run a second course at GCC, I want to change the course I'm running, I want to be able to get more funding to get extra teachers in to come and help to run you know, some of our tech units or to run our choir or something like that, it can require a bit of a buy-in from SLT. So these are all, and, and the reason that I've mentioned Ofsted loads is because that seems to be the magic word that gets things to happen. And I've used a lot of these quotes in my school when talking about why I think it's important to invest in music. So um, if there was any issues with curriculum time, the new um, stuff is the new um, stuff from Ofsted is really, really clear that you should be having at least one hour a week of compulsory music until year nine, um, and that Ofsted would look down on, on schools which had a carousel approach or that had inadequate um, time. Uh, they talked about distorting effects of inappropriate whole school systems on the operation of music departments, including assessment schedules, progression models, and generic teaching strategies. This includes things like whole school literacy focuses, where you have to start 15 minutes of your lesson with some reading, great in lots of subjects. When you've only got one hour a week to do practical music, it can be a killer. And so Ofsted have recognized and said, we don't want that to impede on musical um, learning. Few other subjects are so dependent on flexible support from the school and its systems to flourish. The activities that music entails also have financial implications, the magic word, uh, particularly given the social justice imperative to ensure equal opportunities for the involvement in the school's music provision. Basically, that's give us money, I think, because we need it to be able to do all this good stuff. And uh, strengthen leader, this was a recommendation, strengthen senior leadership of music in schools by increasing head teachers and senior leaders' knowledge and understanding of the key characteristics and effective music provision. So SLT should know what's going on in their music departments and should know what they can do to make those departments even more inclusive and even more more kind of wide-ranging in their offer. Um, this is the way I sold it. Running um, appropriate Key Stage 4 courses means a better uptake for the subject. It means a better uptake for those vulnerable groups um, and students with different backgrounds. Better results. The results that I get in my school for GCC are much more better now that I've got the, the kind of uh, different courses available. And it means growth in the things that they love, like big concerts and high, you know, which we all love really, don't we? But, you know, it looks great in the school as well. Um, but also, I did, and, and, and in trying to make changes at my school, when I came up, came up against those walls of money or of uh, these kind of things, I used a lot of the hub partnership to help out with that and to get people in and to, and to use colleagues to help strengthen the case. So I'd very, very much recommend it. Um, so, there's a little bit about uh, music curriculum. I'll just really briefly touch on extracurricular because obviously that is a really important part of being a music teacher. In some ways, the extracurricular is, you know, in my day, extracurricular can be as big as the curricular in many ways. It's an essential part of musical life at school. And sometimes we don't always think about whether our extracurricular provision is diverse and inclusive 
as our, as our, uh, our, our kind of music provision on the curriculum. So one thing to think about is, does the school offer a range of clubs reflecting the diversity of the curriculum? And how can you further develop this? So I, a few years ago, did some student voice to find out what kind of they would like to do more of. And there was lots of, sort of oh, I'd love to do some more pr production. I'd love to do like a rock band type thing or something like that. Um, and, and was able to then take that to SLT and kind of give the, uh, this is what we should be running extracurricular in our school runs after school and so you've got that added barrier of we want kids to actually stay on after school I was lucky enough to be able to make the case for I want to run a boys choir and I want to do it in tutor time and so the kids are here they don't have to stay on after school and you know we got an incredible take up for it which then actually resulted in an after school club which had great attendance as well so that initial kind of buy in from SLT giving me that time to be able to do it resulted in more uh, of that more of that going on in extracurricular as well. Um, using parents, other staff, and music hub partnership can really help. As I say, you can get people in to help run these groups. And we've had people in running like hip hop production clubs that have been provided by the hub, which has just been fantastically invading, uh, engaging for kids. Um, so, yeah. Concerts, trips and tours, PP funding, all that kind of stuff can really, really help with that as well. So I just wanted to add that in as like a, a last kind of consideration of what, um, how we can make extracurricular just as inclusive as well. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today and just get us thinking about what, uh, how inclusive our music curriculum is and how we can make it even more so. And I was talking at the start about sort of me as a teenager and thinking, how can I, and I always sort of come back to that, of how can I make sure that that kid who loves music or even just has the potential to love music but doesn't feel in connected to what they're doing at school, how can we make sure we provide something for them? And obviously through my own experience, I draw back to that, but today's teenagers are not like me as a teenager in the early 2000s. They've got their own kind of things, and so it is a continued process of development, and I am trying to continue to learn actually what teenagers now are looking for and how we can support them as well. So um, I hope that over the course of the day we can have a little bit of a chat of these things and, and, uh, and, and find out how these things can uh, take, take off even further in your schools. But if anyone has any questions, please do let me know. All right? Thank you very much indeed. Um, Laurel and I, by Thanks some lucky much, disaster, um, ended up at the same school. And um, we are both coffee, music leads so and both that. assistant heads um, there. So we spend our again, entire please. lives doing... Uh, creative things and doing uh, all we're kinds gonna of go to crazy a coffee things. Break. And what we're uh, going to talk about this morning is um, Berlioz 150. Speech, we were so commissioned we, we need another round of applause by for that. the Berlioz 150 Society and, uh, well, yes, to we'll create have a, for a series minutes. of um, lesson plans for primary um, colleagues. And actually, Dan also was commissioned to do the same for secondary colleagues. So if you're a secondary specialist and, and you're wondering what this looks like at, at secondary, then Dan will be able to tell you. And um, the inclusivity for us really was looking at, we recognize that for us in primary education, there are often lots and lots of our colleagues who just do not feel that confidence and passion for music. You know, they have to teach it because it's part of the curriculum, but they just don't quite know exactly how to do it. And I think music's quite unusual in that um, compared to lots of other different subjects. So um, we had an immense amount of fun unpicking. We were given exactly what we needed to teach. And we were told that Symphony Fantastique, one of values is great orchestral works was um, what we needed to write our lesson plans around and then our challenge was to make that relevant to every one of our students and to make it accessible to be taught by teachers so that's uh, what we're going to unpick for you this morning. Hello. Um, yeah, so we're going to start off by showing you um, a little a film that was made to launch um, this project. And it's me, um, a very pregnant me, my, my baby's about somewhere, um, a very pregnant me, feeling a little bit frazzled but having an amazing time, um, teaching a wonderful class of year four. Um, we work um, at Hawfield Primary. We serve um, a very diverse mixed catchment area. Um, every child uh, in that class is in that room and engaging in um, Symphony Fantastique with me. Um, so we'll start with... Uh, watching the film and then we'll have um, more of a chat about it in a bit here we go first test if it'll work
Fantastic for Schools is an innovative music education programme uh, that focuses on specific composers and specific works, initially Berlioz and his symphony Fantastic. I really liked it because it told a story. For like Music Number 5 with the witches dancing, it made it sound all cackly and jerky. I would encourage teachers to get involved with Fantastic for Schools because I think it allows children to really learn about music by immersing them within it. Um, the programme's been specifically designed for specialists and non-specialists. The resources can all be accessed for free online and the resources really do walk you through the lesson step by step. There's a variety of different activities. Um, it makes the learning really meaningful and memorable for the children and you can learn alongside them. You can learn about Berlioz by looking at the resources with them. He didn't give up on his dreams because people held him back. I like that there's different instruments playing rather than just um, about two instruments and someone singing. To start with, there are five lessons, two for primary and three for secondary school children. The lessons are highly engaging, hands-on and practical and they really allow the children to explore by doing. The lessons have a variety of activities that encourage children's creative responses to the music that they hear. Um, and all of the activities aim to make the work very meaningful and memorable for the children. I loved doing the conducting and learning. I've definitely had fun so far. I like doing the weaving, seeing all the layers, each of them meaning like different musical instruments play at a time. I really enjoyed doing the graphic marking because it was fun just listening to the music and drawing what you thought it sounded like on the page. I really enjoyed doing the glockenspiels and communicating with people by music. I really enjoyed writing the reviews. You got to use your ideas about what you thought of Berlioz and Symphony Fantastique. The programme in particular is great because it allows children to really deeply explore this one work and a bit about the life of this uh, really inspirational composer. This piece of music, Symphony Fantastique, is particularly engaging for children because it tells a story um, and that's great because it allows children to really uh, focus their listening and they can hook their ideas onto something, in this case the story of the work. It's also very grand in its scale, um, so the piece is quite shocking, quite surprising, scored for over 90 instruments. So the children's reaction to the music is definitely a highlight for me. Well, different bits made me feel different things. The first movement made me feel more calm and relaxed because it was all about a dream. When I listened to the march, it made me feel really energetic. It's fun to learn what the music is saying. In some parts, I was kind of scared. I like classical music because it's so big. I used to be scared of classical music. I like to play the trumpet. I would choose to play the violin. Um, if I was in the orchestra, I'd play the trombone because it looks fun. A lot of the time, when you grow up, you're thinking, oh, I wish I played an instrument and I wish I learned how to play music. Uh, so if you learn it in school, then you do learn some music. As Laurel said, we do serve a very diverse community. We have a lot of people. I spend a lot of time finding funding to be able to get to learn an instrument. But some of those children are learning the bassoon. How cool is that? Because music is for everyone. And that's something that we are really, really passionate about. Dan mentioned the Modern Music Curriculum and a fantastic document. It's, it just serves that purpose that shows that music really matters. Um, and I also want just to... to uh, 
to go back to one of Dan's comments as well about that, the comment about the inch and the mile and, and how, you know, you, you can cover a lot of things, but not very well. But actually, and again, the Ofsted report in July 2021 said, really, less is more. We need to get our children to really know something really, really well. And that was one of our targets for the Berlioz. Um, yeah, um, Amanda Spillman said as well that we should be ambitious for what we expect in music in the primary classroom. Um, and I think that's so relevant here, the idea that all children do have the right and the ability and the passion, if you unlock it, um, to access a huge variety of genre. So our, our aim here was really to open the door um, to something that was grand in scale, that um, put the child at the centre of the learning and really sort of broadened their horizons in terms of their musical experiences. And I think you can tell from the reaction of some of the children in that film, that, that it did that. It had this scope for them. It felt ambitious, and they realized that when we were doing it. Um, so all of the lessons, as we've said, um, are available for free online, as well as all the resources, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, to start off with, there are two lessons for primary and three for secondary. We're going to obviously speak about the primary in a bit more detail. To say that their lessons is, is a bit wrong. It's a bit wrong, because um, whenever Kirsten and I are asked to do anything, we tend to take it quite far. Um, so it's, it's sort of two lessons, but you could make it a term. <laughs> you could make it a whole day. You could do Berlioz Day. You could do Berlioz Term. You could just do two standalone lessons. You could weave it into other things and create sort of a golden thread of music making throughout stuff. Um, so it really is a wide variety of resources. And we know that as primary teachers, we are time poor, but sort of excitement rich. So there's plenty in there that you can choose for yourself. You can adapt. You can take on all of it or little pieces of it, really. It's, it's there for you to access as you want. One of the things I think is really important for children, for all of our children, to see that musicians don't just stand alone as musicians. Everything about their life is important to them as well. And one of the things that we aim to do is not just to introduce the music of Berlioz, but sort of set him in place in terms of chronology, in terms of uh, social, where he lived, in terms of country, and so the children could actually properly unpick exactly who he was. I think if we want to consider that a lesson like this could be truly inclusive and really engaging for every child, I think we need to think about the way that children often learn best. Um, and in particular in primary, that's by creating the biggest memory splash possible, I often find. Music is one of those unique activities that if taught and learned well, accesses all of the areas in the brain, doesn't it? Creating this, this huge splash of memory, this huge excitement. Um, and I think what we've done here is we've tried to make sure that all of the learning is really relevant by making sure the activities are very multi-sensory. It would be quite easy, and I think it's often done, to approach this sort of work or this sort of composer in a very listening and appraising sort of way. Um, and we have included a lot of kinesthetic, musical, literacy-inspired activities, performance and composition are in there as well to make sure that the children are learning the way they learn best. As well as that, when children are listening and you're, you're teaching them to listen as a teacher, it's quite easy to make it quite superficial um, and actually to end up asking the same questions again and again and again. And one of the reasons that we explored all these different activities was to get the children to start questioning, to get them to really listen with depth and curiosity to all of these different things. This particular activity here could be seen as an art activity. So you need to make sure that you unpick it really carefully. It's all about timbre. It's all about the texture of the orchestra. And you heard a little bit of a clip of that when, where they were talking about the fact that they recognise those bits of ribbon being different instruments of the orchestra and how they layer up. And then if you go back into that classroom now, that child really understands about exactly what the texture of the orchestra is. Um, similarly, an activity like this one, um, this is the children writing a review of Symphony Fantastique. Again, this isn't a literacy activity, it's a literacy vehicle, and the literacy is, is enriching the music making that's happening here, but it allows the children to really develop and use the language of those interrelated dimensions of music, but also to talk about the music in language that is relevant for them. I mean, I think this one talks about it being bouncy, um, because it was really bouncy. As I listened, I could imagine witches dancing. Um, so this idea that they can use language to speak about the music that they hear and they can hang it on this literacy activity. And you could certainly use this as a literacy activity as well if you wanted to and you wanted to take it further. But the music is at the, is at the heart of the learning here. And it's the music that shines through when you're looking at this piece of writing. 
All the resources are embedded within the um, website. So when you kind of look into it, all these different things are there ready for you to use. So we commissioned a wonderful artist to create things that really were, that sort of lifted the children, that really made them think this is really special, something that they were really working with. So the resources are all there and you can see that you can use them um, not only within the Berlioz, but you can take them much, much further. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the activities uh, that feature in the lessons. Um, we wanted to make sure that, as we said, music making was really at the heart of everything that we're doing here, but also allowing space for the children's creative responses to the work, as well as actually deepening the understanding of the music itself. I think sometimes it's easy to go on a tangent of one or the other sometimes. It's wonderful to listen and have your own creative responses, but what's the music objective and what are you learning? Or similarly, you can go too far down on the knowledge route and not allow for that creative expression. So we're hoping that these things um, really balance that. Um, all of the activities are presented in this way um, so that you can interact with the slides. Um, here, the shepherd's call and response and the follow me game are allowing the children to sort of deepen their understanding and engaging in real music making um, and enhancing their understanding of the work itself. Quite often as primary practitioners, we kind of um, are, not, are not dangerous enough. We don't sort of take enough risks. And I think actually our children are very, very capable of understanding and unpicking some really complex works if we present it to them in the right way. So we use the Aurora Orchestra, who we're very much hoping might come at some point to Beacon and, and play for us their incredible performance where they do it entirely without music. And, but we carefully unpick it. Um, so this particular slide here, we discover the Ide Fix, we discover Harriet in the music, and the children can really easily hear that when they're directed towards it. Um, and then again, this really wonderful um, film the Who Am I that we created in, in consultation with Berlioz 150 just explains and contextualizes Berlioz. Oh, I'm going to carry on, aren't I? Um, then another aspect of it was to look at some of our children working within the classroom that weren't quite going to be able to make that uh, leap straight to the accessibility of all of our activities. So here I've just got some examples of activities which we used to make some of the things that we'd done more accessible. When we were looking at the glockenspiels um, and we were doing call and response and we were doing echo, actually this could be very, very effectively done. Instead of the glockenspiels, which are sort of obviously working with small things, working with the big sonor um, bars, looking at echo, looking at the difference between can you form a conversation between you, so I had an LSA working with me, um, and one of the students. Can they create an echo, just echoing back a, a very, very simple three or four note, and can they then maybe create a call and response as well? What is a call and response? Can they create this discussion with a teacher or another leader within the classroom? So every child has been part of that lesson and moved forward at the same time. Can the children think about, here's an example of using the uh, music through the sound box. Can these children then choose a color for each of the different movements? Which particular color would they question would actually fit? Could they choose an emoji and put those into a plan so that the same music can be accessible for all of our children? And again here, this was an example where I chose an, a kinesthetic activity for each of the movements. So as the children were immersed in listening to the movement, they were actually engaged in a different activity. So you, depending on how well you know the work, you might be able to decide which we were doing when. Um, the, first, the first movement, Reveries, we had lots of feathers, um, throwing them up, watching them fall, but listening to the first movement as we do them, playing with the feathers. So the immersion, the children were unlocking the door to be able to listen to the music by doing something active. We were looking at here with Play-Doh and uh, sparkly things. We were looking at the sparkle of the ball. Um, and then we were looking at the, the march, which is much harder, the march to the scaffold. We were looking at building and constructing things. The, uh, the movement with the two shepherds, we were looking at creating paper flowers, which unfolded as you put them into water and watching them unfold. And then um, the final movement, we had ribbons and moving with them. So the children were doing an activity as they were listening to the music, and it was that which enabled the listening to take place. Again here, the activity that we did when we were looking and doing graphic score, instead of creating the children, creating their own graphic score, they were exploring with colors, with me giving them symbols to start with. 
And again, the same with building a texture. When uh, it was impossible to do the weaving with the um, ribbon, we created different ways of, of building things. We used Lego to build blocks. We used tearing paper to layer it, and we used paints. Um, as we said, we aim to make this really accessible for our colleagues who are music specialists, but many primary music leads are not necessarily specialists, even if they're the lead. Um, and everybody in that classroom, all the teachers in that classroom, are teaching a subject perhaps with which they're less familiar. Um, so all of the lessons are accessible for any primary colleague. Um, all of the slides that we have, the interactive Google Slides, guide you through the whole lesson, and you can learn about Berlioz and this particular work alongside the children. It was really important for us to include everything you would need all in one place. You know, find file audio 7A, B, and move it to 30 seconds, and your sound doesn't work, and it's, you know, and all your children are looking up at you very wide-eyed, and they're ready, but you're not. Um, so everything is in one place, easily accessible. We've also got supporting notes for the teachers as well. My pet peeve um, in a subject that I'm not very good at, like maths, is when a lesson will pose a question and then doesn't answer it in the planning for me. Can the children think of another way to build that number? And I think, can they? If... If they did, what would that look like, perhaps? <laughs> and I don't know. So any questions that are posed are always answered, and musical terms are explained as well as you go along. So everything you need is there. Um, also, perhaps if you wanted to delve a little deeper with your children, we've spoken about being ambitious. We have a huge amount of primary colleagues that are experts and are really passionate and have a huge wealth of knowledge about the subject. So if you want to, um, there are plenary activities and lots of other things that you can delve a little bit deeper in with, with your children as well. If an activity requires a little more explanation, this is a follow me game. I'm not sure you've ever done those little cards and somebody says, I am a wind, a wind instrument with a double reed, but not a cor anglais or a bassoon. And somebody else has to spot who they think they are and you join it up in a big long chain. Um, there are little videos as well that explain how games like that work. You can either watch them with your children and a little me will pop up and explain it to them or you can watch it yourself and just have a really good grasp of exactly how this works before you can attempt it with your children. An activity like this really deepens their understanding of orchestration and works really well at the end of a series of lessons. It really allows them to showcase their knowledge, um, which by the time I, I sort of did two Berlioz days, which was just joyful, by the end of those days, children really reveled in this activity. They really enjoyed showcasing their knowledge and learning from each other, as Kirsten said, and working collaboratively. I love that quote at the beginning, that music is collaborative and it's challenging, and so we hope that our activities are that as well. So the two separate plans, there's one all about the storyteller, and then the second plan is called Berlioz as an orchestrator. And certainly it's that depth, it's that real understanding, it's that real getting to know the, um, the different people. And in Bristol, we tend to have this as a six-week plan um, for Key Stage 2. Laurel has trialled it, as she said, with Year 4, and I've done it with Year 6. And these next slides show you some of the graphic school we did with Year 6. Again, really thinking and unpicking and giving children really time to discuss it amongst themselves as well as actually trying to push them forward too quickly. So here they were thinking about each of these little squares as a different one of the movements and really thinking about different graphic school that they could use to present and portray the different movements. And these are just examples to show that there's no right or wrong, I think. Um, it's easy for children to sort of be pushed into sort of thinking the answer they should be giving. But actually, we were trying to push their boundaries, trying to extend them, trying to really, really deepen their knowledge. You can have a look um, at any point when you're having lunch. We put a table out there just of some examples of work that we've done with the children and some examples of the resources so you can have a little look at them. These were graphic scores that we created. Our... Uh, our score in miniature that the children created with their, uh, each of the different movements. And again, how important is it that we teach our children there is no wrong and that every genre is music is accessible to all of them and I always think with primary children particularly we need to reach the sky we need to aim higher we need to really push their boundaries and they always 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 show us that they can do it. So these were just some examples that um, we worked with year six. And we were using here the words really to take us into the interlated dimensions of music. And that was our kind of way in to be able to talk about the music.
Um, one of the activities we did, which the children really engaged with really effectively, was uh, the idea of um, marking the beat um, to become Berlioz, to become a conductor, to see themselves as a conductor. Um, had a wonderful conversation with them about a conductor being a job, um, which they thought was pretty amazing. And then we went down a bit of a rabbit hole and we got to find some female conductors and off we go. Um, but... This activity allows the children to really feel and internalise the music, again, to put them at the centre, that they are active, they aren't passively listening, they are engaged in active music making. Um, here's a little video of me very frantically counting. Ah, that one slows down, then it speeds up again. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, they loved this. Um, and we had children at the front conducting everybody, but it was about them internalizing the feeling of the music as well. And when they were there, their white chalk is there, their baton. Um, and this idea that, yes, they were learning about beat patterns and, yes, they were internalising their sense of pulse, but they were also really developing their understanding of the different feeling of these movements and how a conductor like Berlioz can really capture that and tease that from an orchestra that they're working with. This is another a little clip of an activity that we've mentioned um, that puts composition at the heart. I think sometimes, for primary speaking for myself, composition is a pretty hard one. Um, leaves me stuck sometimes. And I think that if we want children to become really confident composers, we do need to give them the building blocks um, to get there. And... Um, break that sort of process down for them. This is also a really great assessment activity, talking about a call and response and an echo, and do children understand the difference between them and what pieces of music can they create with their partner. Um, here's a little clip. Here's a good time to talk about the fact that I did this as a carousel, which was bold. Um, <laughs> so they were working at the same time as everybody else. Um, I love working that way. Um, children rotated around the room every time they heard a particular movement. They stood up and they moved in the style of that movement to a different table. But you could absolutely have everybody doing this at once if you've got enough glockenspiels and you're somehow amazing. But, um, yeah, I did this as a carousel, which did really work. It's quite a quiet, tinkly, pleasant sound. And children really engaged in this activity because they weren't onlookers. They were part of the music making. They were at the heart of it here. And those children with those glockenspiels, when they came out of the classroom, they said, oh, we were the shepherds. They could, take, could tell me exactly which part of the story that they came from. And they could say, oh, do you know what? We did two things. We did the echo. That happens at the beginning. We did the echo first, and then they explained what an echo was. And then we went on to the call and response. So in doing and making the music, they really understood exactly what they were doing. We've just put this in there just to show that we were actually following kind of the national curriculum and what we should be doing. And, uh, but then actually, just to reinforce, I think that creativity is so important. It's so important that when we're teaching our children, we're teaching them something that's meaningful and memorable, that as they walk out the classroom, they can really verbalize that wow factor, that sparkle. You can't ever walk past Laurel's classroom without some kind of sparkle going on there. And I think our children really need that. They need to know there's some really quality, quality education going on there. Um, I'll speak very briefly in a bit more detail about the second lesson or sort of group of activities, specifically about Berlioz, the orchestrator. Um, and we wanted to begin that with a hook. Um, primary teachers love a good hook. Um, if we're talking about making everything inclusive and bringing everyone with us, I think to introduce the children to a character, to the person Berlioz really worked here. Um, you know those times when you realise your job is weird? One of those is when I was trying to forge Berlioz's signature in a variety of different ways. You know, you kind of come out of yourself sometimes think this job is odd but also brilliant um, so it begins with a letter from Berlioz himself inviting the children to be part of his orchestra for the first ever performance of Symphony Fantastique um, we give the children 
um, a little envelope, which they're very excited to open, which had their instrument inside one of um, Holly, the artist we worked with, one of her pieces of art. And their first task is to take out the instrument and find their desk partner to start the rehearsal. So to start with a hook is to open the door for everybody immediately, to get everybody excited, to create that buzz around what we're doing, and also quickly to get everybody up and moving. We're going to do something here. We're not just going to sit and listen. Um, and this is another example of an activity that, um, as Kirsten's mentioned, makes listening really accessible for everyone and truly inclusive because it allows the children to hook their ideas and that language onto something physical, onto something kinesthetic. I think sometimes we're really good at doing that sort of thing in maths. For example, a place value grid and counters. There's a physical representation of what you're explaining. And sometimes in other subjects, that's less achievable, particularly listening to work like this, which is so grand in scale. So to have something physical in front of them, the children weave as they listen. Um, and mine were listening on iPads on the interactive slides so that they could move um, throughout the movements freely. But you could have it on the speaker in the classroom with everybody listening and doing it at the same time. Um, I provided them with a variety of different materials, of different thicknesses, different textures, and it really allowed them to unpick that understanding of timbre. Again, often a difficult one to explain um, and a difficult one to teach, I think. Um, it allowed us to really look at the score and unpick things that perhaps we assume they understand. The idea of left to right, the idea of multiple instruments working together to create an overall whole. And the children really could talk about that very confidently after this activity. This sort of activity is, again, not an art activity because it's the process, not the product. Although, don't get me on that soapbox because so much amazing art learning is about the process, not the product, but I'll, I'll step down. Um, the fact that the children can talk about this and narrate it as they do it, encourage lots of talking here. Um, the fact that they can explain, well, this is my double bass because I've put it at the bottom. I've chosen a really thick ribbon because it's a big sound. The silvery line is a quiet instrument coming in and suddenly interrupting the sound, sparkling on the top. So the fact that the weaving, the process of it, gives them the opportunity to really listen with purpose, but also to talk about what they hear. And I'm very aware of the time that we have to stop. So this is the very final slide, um, and this just shows you where you need to go. It's all free. So um, if you go to www.fantastic.school, then you can log in. Uh, you only log in so we can see who's accessed it and, and hopefully get it as far and wide as possible. We know there already is lots of schools that are, that are using this all around the country. Um, and as we said, there are those two big lesson plans which would easily fit a full term, um, plus all of Dan's wonderful secondary um, plans as well. And I think that is probably all thank you very much indeed for listening round of applause for uh, Kirsten and Laurel please and we're just doing a little stage change so talk to your partner about what this time what to eat at Easter, and it can't be an egg. Today will be sent out to everyone. Is that going to be a few? That's good. Yes. And you can all stop writing now. <laughs> stop scribing. The second thing is it's all being filmed, and we'll send out. Um, if filming is your preferred. Uh, I don't think there's any other urgent things that have come up, but obviously come and talk to us. So this is the first panel Q&A, um, based on what we've seen and heard this morning. Um, and I've taken questions, I had the, the absolute joy of watching through last year's conference last Sunday, watching all of the videos and taking the key questions from the closing um, speech. They're all still available on YouTube. If you want to hear how young people aged between 18 and 25 felt about music education, they're all still available, and I'll send them out with the, with when we do a uh, send out afterwards. Um, so yes, these are some questions that came up. So if we take three from the young people from last year, and uh, then a couple from the floor, maybe three or four, that would be great. Shall we start? Question one. 
Are we all feeling good? Nervous? <laughs> uh, this is a... Yeah, okay. When will the only entry requirement for Key Stage 4 music be an interest in taking music at Key Stage 4? And what needs to change to get us there? Who wants to take that? <laughs> I can start. <laughs> Yeah, it's such a good question, and it's something that, has, like, since I started teaching, has been the question that I've been asking myself when it comes to Key Stage 4 music. A really good quote from our hub leader in Bristol, he said to me when, when I was talking about this, he said, the exam boards aren't going to change for us, like, we're going to have to make them change. And so we are working within a system where a lot of the courses that are on offer are inaccessible to a lot of students, which is a really challenging place to be. And so, you know, as I, as I sort of said in the presentation, I think the first one was, is, is looking at the range of courses available because they're not all the same. And you might find that some are more appropriate than others. And that's about your cohort. I think for some cohorts, for example, the ADXL, the OCR specification would be really appropriate. For some cohort, uh, cohorts, the, uh, the vocational um, specification will be really appropriate. I have a really mixed cohort in our school. We're between one of the most well-off and one of the most deprived areas in Bristol, and our school's bang in the middle. So we get like an absolute mix, and so being able to run both of those courses allowed that to kind of work. That's not, a, you know, not necessarily possible in every single school. But yeah, looking at the courses available and trying to find one which is best for your cohort. And then I think it's just about like making noise about it because the exam boards won't change until we make them. And I think that when this problem is, is brought up again and again and again and is discussed more and more, I think the exam boards will probably be the last ones to change, but that's what we need to happen. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else like to add to that, Lisa? Um, I think it's, you know, being accessible, it comes back to that whole conversation that you were having with the students, that if you haven't taken up an instrument in year six, then that's mm. you done for, for the rest. And we've got to remember that everybody has an instrument within themselves, that you, know, you can be a vocalist, and that vocal skill can be so broad. Um, and that's really got to be nurtured through primary and, and in key stage three as well. Um, and, you know, core, core of four of the National Plan for Music Education is about a singing strategy in your schools and making sure that's not tokenistic. It's not just that occasionally you sing in assembly or that you do a production and some of the children are part of that, you know, or there is a school choir, all of which are brilliant and should be happening anyway. But what's happening in the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis? What opportunities are there to make music really accessible? Because that's, that's what everybody's got. Um, and there's Associated Board um, have really had quite radical changes over the last couple of years. If you, if you think you know ABRSM, maybe have a little look at them now, because it's quite different. Um, and one of the things that they've, they've developed is their musical theatre syllabus which, I don't know if you're like me, massive fan. Um, but a lot of children are as well. I mean, you don't have to necessarily just think about the stage. You can think about Disney. You know, the, the songs are hugely popular. So let's make sure that we're engaging children in singing. And one of the things that I suggested, actually, in the last secondary um, teachers network meeting was that um, actually you could do one of these performance grade kind of exams with your children um, at Key Stage 3. You could teach the whole class um, one of the grade one, grade two pieces. And then maybe for some of those, build their confidence up and say, do you, do you realize actually what you've done now in the classroom is so good, you could actually record this and submit it and get a music qualification. It gives them the sense that they have got ownership over their musicianship. They can take it forward and then they can use it at Key Stage 4. So I think, you know, don't forget about the voice because mm. that's really accessible for everyone. Great. Anyone else? Take this. GCSE, P Stage 4. Well, I suppose I should fly the flag for accessible music technologies and the barriers that a lot of traditional instruments present. I mean, I, has anyone heard of the Ovi Trust, the 100 Musical Instrument Trust, based in Birmingham? They're sort of, the name suggests, trying to solve a problem that, like, you know, in terms of progression, like, there aren't, if you've got a hand impairment, there aren't instruments that are available and I still hear about young people who are like, oh well, you can't do music so we'll send you, we'll give you a job in the office or something, or young people, in, I'm talking about 
young disabled people in mainstream schools who just get excluded from music because like, oh music's not for you, you can't do that. And that is, well, it's quite depressing isn't it really? But like, how we, yeah we do, I think technology is the clue. Contrary to I guess popular belief, I'm not like the biggest advocate of like it having to be a really tech solution. I see a lot of technology in, and I'm biting down the feed somewhat, but I do speak at tech events and stuff. And some of it is like very clever, but like, well, so what? You know what I mean? Like, it, if it doesn't get people excited about music making, I hope that what I'm doing with the gloves and the school's gloves, I know a few people have asked about the school's gloves, I'll show, if anyone's interested at lunchtime, I'll show you those. <coughs> um, like, I just want people to get excited about the music making and not get, I think that with your work as well, there's a, a line between it being very clever tech, but actually, is it actually inviting to people? Do they actually want to play music with it? Yeah. And that's a, but I mean, we're not even, I don't feel like we're even at the point where we're having that conversation in mainstream mm -hmm. schools yet, especially for sure. young disabled people in mainstream, because I know what it feels like to sort of fall through that gap. Mm -hmm. you know. Lee, do you want to take that on? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I am, the reason that I'm working for Music Works is an act of vengeance on my music department when I was at school, because yes. I'm, I'm the wrong shape and size to play most instruments. I've got short, fat fingers, I've never been able to play guitar, and I've always, and I was told I wasn't musical. And I knew from pri my primary education that music was, I, I was musical, I could sing, but I, you know, I didn't want to sing in secondary school because I was scared of being picked on, and all the other instruments were inaccessible to me. So it was only because there was a, a kindly music teacher who, who let me use one of my free periods to go and, and study music that rekindled that passion for me, and I never forgot that sense of exclusion. And so through the work I do at the Music Works as a disability lead, I'm always looking for new instruments, new ways that I can find those people for whom music's kind of passed them by, or they've been told they're not included for whatever reason, and find a way of reigniting that passion, because it's been the, the one thread that's kept me going throughout my career. It's been the, the one thing that I've done, so I've, I've been a performer, I've had my own record label, um, I've, I've, I've taught music from primary school to degree level, and it's really, for me, it's about find, you know, finding those people who are, who are like passionate at any stage, and enabling them to make music, so it's like, I, that's why I don't sort of have this one-size-fits-all approach. Um, please come and see us in the sensory room because I, I collect instruments yeah. and have been for decades and we've got everything in there from state-of-the-art equipment to two carrots that you can touch <laughs> and start making music. It's literally that, that accessible. So it's, it's been part of my journey has been, has been take, you know, having that accessibility at the core and, and finding ways that people can make music and engage outside of what is provided in the mainstream so that they're still included as part of that ensemble. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Malachi? Um, just to follow on from that, everything you said, yeah, I totally agree with. And also there's cultural barriers as well. You know, I know for me in school, um, I felt excluded actually just because I didn't identify with any of the genres that were taught. And actually for me, I, I classed myself as very musical as growing up. When I went to school, I didn't feel musical at all. So I just disengaged with everything. And I actually, and I still see it today, there's a lot of young people who still come to me. We have a lot of progression routes into talent development in our organisation. And a lot of young people say similar things, you know, they just didn't, engage with the genres that were taught in school as well, so. Yeah, there's another question which will lead on from that, but Lauren, I was just wondering from a primary perspective how you can help that simply stage four. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I, I yeah. think like, all too often it's, we think about transition and, yeah. you know, a bit of year six and then and then a bit of year seven and, and I mean, transition is hugely challenging anyway, I know, but I, I think it's about thinking of a, of a journey starting from reception all the way through. Um, a child's educational life and I, and I think it, it's helpful to think in those terms that it is a journey right from the beginning. I also think it's helpful for teachers to have a little more of an understanding of where their children have come from and where they are going and to think of it more as an arc in that way. Um, I think the question about when it will just be about a love of music, a, um, you know, a, a passion for it, I think um, investing more in primary educators in terms of their passion, their enthusiasm, their knowledge and expertise in, in music. Um, I, I think that would, that would help because then you would create more opportunities for children within primary because as Dan said, you know, you can have year seven sitting in that room who sadly have had little to no real music and experience. So I think if we had more children that had that passion and, you know, you talk about making noise, I think that, that would make more noise. Um, I love music and I'm really passionate about it and I had an hour in my teacher training, a, a single hour, um, and we did something with boom whackers, which... 
um, and could have been amazing, but wasn't. And uh, and that was it. That was my hour. Um, and it's it's so tricky when when that's what we're offering. So I think investing in the person who's standing at the front of that room of primary children who can really excite them um, and make the curriculum fit for purpose for them in, in the variety of ways that we've talked about changing the curriculum and changing the expertise of that teacher at the front. Fantastic. You've covered so many of the questions. I'm going to go to the floor because I think there'll be people with wanting to put hands up. Who's got a question for this lot? You. So let you go back to GCSE. Mm -hmm. I was just curious that when you were trying to establish multiple options for GCSE courses, that uh, was there any particular difficulties, challenges in the within school, and how you came around them? Can yeah. I just respond, just so that we get it on mic, it's my, just a technical thing. So Yun's asking, when you go to look to multiple courses at GCSE, what are the challenges and how do we overcome them? Yeah, so it was mainly <coughs> funding and timetabling, it's like linked thing. Basically, I was a single person department before we offered multiple courses, with some help from a non-specialist. And I was basically saying, well, to be able to give a truly inclusive music offer, we're going to need another teacher to be able to actually do this. And obviously that's quite a big ask then, to go to school and say, we need actually more funding for an additional member of staff. Um, and we were able to get that on a part-time basis um, after, and it did genuinely take a couple of years of me you know, just going back and, and really kind of pressing this issue. Um, and I think it was... Like initially, it was kind of it wasn't a high priority because I think that sometimes music in school can be seen as the niche thing that it was when I was at school. Like when I was at school, it was like, oh, there's those ten kids and they're the music ones, and then there's the rest of us, you know. And so I think that sometimes in school, leadership can see it that way as well and say, well, I'm not going to invest in this thing which really affects this small group of of children, and so. What the case I had to make was, no, this is so that we can avoid that and, and so that we can have this offer which is appropriate for all of our students. And I think that, you know, something that worked in our benefit was at the time we'd recently have an Ofsted inspection which told us that we weren't doing enough for our mixed cohort and for students um, coming from like PP backgrounds, for example. So I was able to really sell, look at how this new thing will make our music education more inclusive. And that was ultimately the thing that got there. But um, yeah, so I guess... So those are off step, is it? That helped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and then just persistence, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Anyone else? On the floor? Steve? Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, sorry, uh, the, um, is the curriculum based again? Yeah. We do um, carousel-based uh, stuff in our school, and it's, um, I'm really, really struggling with time. Mm. I'm really struggling with the amount of stuff that we've got to teach, and I have to say, we teach well, yeah. but it's, it, it's a, the breadth of the university, and that really sort of resonated with me, it really struck cool with me. My question is essentially, I, we have them for nine, we, nine doubles a year, right. um, which is really mm. hard. Um, my question essentially is how do I narrow it down? How much we have to teach? Yeah. It's nine dollars a year and essentially what where do I go with that? What what things what are the most important things for sort of, you guys think that I can do in that moment? Great, and I'm just gonna repeat that. So how does a school that gets nine double sessions a year, which is eighteen hours, which is sort of half of an adult's working week, um, cramming all that musical learning, um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, just to start off, I think that what's been great about the recent documents provided by Ofsted, the model music curriculum, the research review, is they have tackled that issue head on and said, we don't want to see that. And so I would say the, the first thing, and I'm sure this is something you've done already, so apologies, but just for the benefit of everybody, is like taking these documents to SLT and saying, Ofsted has said that if you are running music on a, on a carousel, it's not good enough. And hoping that, you know, that will, coming from, you know, the lofty source of Ofsted will, will make some kind of impact. Um, so 
you know, I, I really hope that that kind of carousel approach is something that we see changing over the next few years. Obviously, where you are now and you've got to deal with it, that's a really challenging thing. And I think that, you know, what, what was talked about in the primary um, one as well about, about that depth that we talked about is that it's probably better to do something well but narrower rather than going, right, we've got one week on this genre, one week on another genre where you're really going to struggle to, to do everything. I mean, I think that it might be a good opportunity for some student voice to see what students feel would be really, really valuable, valuable for them in that music education <coughs> they've got. Um, Prioritising the main three strands of listening, composing and performing, it may be that there's particular um, composition-based tech products that would be really, really engaging for students when in a genre that they are passionate about and interested in that would develop the skills of like writing melody, the skills of uh, you know d developing the texture and structure in a piece of music that you could develop in lots of different ways, but would do it in a way that would grab their attention and hopefully be almost like a starting point for them to then pursue you know outside of their limited curriculum <coughs> time. Thanks, Dan. I just wonder from the county perspective and the hub, if we know that about lots of schools, and I do, what do we do? How can we help? Lisa? Yeah, well, one of the roles that we have is to, to go out and visit schools. We try and get out as much as possible. And we do school music education plans. And, and that offer is a free offer of support, which comes in and just helps the school to really reflect on their provision. Um, now, that offer is taken up majority of the time by primary schools which is fantastic however the secondary schools don't tend to think oh we don't need that because obviously we've got curriculum experts in the classroom we've got a leadership team we've got that bigger picture anyway but i wouldn't say that they don't need that sometimes so i think sometimes somebody outside of your institution to come in and review what the provision is to, to be another voice to say are you not aware of what Ofsted is saying here? Are you not aware of the modern music curriculum and the advice that's being given? Can help with that argument. Because you know the people that are here today and who, who will hopefully engage with the recordings are the people who know how important inclusion is in that, having that broad um, curriculum offer. Uh, but it can be really hard to fight that battle on your own, as you were saying. So you need, to, you need to reach out to the hub partners, you need to ask for our support as well. We do it in a very supportive way. We're not like mini offsets coming in. and take, We're there to say, let's just make this the best it can be. And, and you can't do that in isolation. Um, we know that secondaries in particular are, tend to be islands in their own right, and they tend to just deal with themselves. Just a, 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 you know, there are lots of reasons why that happens. But don't forget that you also have a governing body and your governors are the ones that are also insisting and ensuring, or should be ensuring, that your school is offering the breadth of curriculum that should be there. Um, now, some schools go as far as, as having a, a governor connected to each subject area. I'm not sure that happens much any, anymore. But certainly there will be somebody who is, who is there to, to think about curriculum, maybe make contact with, with that, that governor, um, and they can help work with you as well. Um, but also the parents, parent voice is very, very powerful. And we're here to talk about ensuring that children get the right sort of access. But we mustn't forget that in that triangle, that you've got the school, you've got the child, and you've got the parent. And without that parent's involvement in that, you're going to really struggle to make that a really strong model as well. So uh, again, if you, if just think about how you're engaging that, because again, that can also help to make change with a school if you have parental yeah. voice as well. Yeah. I'm just conscious of time, but I wonder, to Dan's point about the 10 and all these young people that are queuing up behind but we don't know, that idea of youth voice in Malachi, I was wondering about what your view of that is like, are there lots of young people who are not being heard and how we can hear them and is it genre, is it diversity, what is it that makes the difference? Yeah, I think there's a lot of young people that are not being heard and reached, especially when it comes to music in school. So if I can remember when I was in school, actually when I said I wasn't musical, when I was going to the youth clubs and actually had access to resources and, and it, it was all different types, whether it was DJ equipment, computers, there was a whole load of young people in there making music on a weekly basis. And it was fantastic. There was collaboration going on and everything. That was so different from in school. And um, actually those young people didn't even realise actually they were classed as probably musicians. And I think that's what we've got to identify is how 
can young people create music in that space and be classed as musicians in that space, but not be classed as musicians or, yeah. you know, in... And I think there's something about youth voice, how do we... So youth voice through school, through parent, might be a different youth voice than if you were to say, for example, look on our registers. If a school came to us and said, are you working with any young people that are in my school? And we could say, we're working with 50 of them. <laughs> yeah. What do they think? You know, so I think there's something about joining up how we hear youth voice, yeah. making sure that it doesn't end up being not those 10, but then the next 20 who are prepared to speak up, but then the next 40 and the next 600 that are actually queuing up behind. And I think there's that thing, it's called the uh, decay model, that you have, of the 100 young people who love music, 20 might access, uh, uh, 80 will get that first access, 20 will then drop off, and then a further 20 drop off, and you end up working with 40 in every 100 or 20 in every 100. There's this, and you've got to start thinking about where you're finding those ones who've decayed <coughs> off. And they're not all in the same place. They're not all on the end of a, of a, of a, of a Google form. And they're not all at the end of a, of, of a parent. And they're not all at the end of the music works. But they're all, they're, if, if you find everyone's voice, you will you'll get a much clearer picture. And it's really Some, someone said it earlier. It's about understanding, and I think once you can understand the child or ch children's voices, yeah. and then that's where I think you can be more inclusive of working with. Yeah. Can I just add to that because I think that's so right. But you you need to find out who your children are, what yeah. the context is, who who's got the interest. You know, that just who's sitting there, who's feeling really disconnected. But actually, outside of school, you've got no idea that they are the biggest superstar in their own right. Um, and that might even just be in their bedroom, um, let alone in another youth um, sort of entity. Um, but you can't do this on your own. Yeah. There's so much that you have to do. As we all know, in, in schools nowadays, it is mind-boggling what is asked of teachers and leadership teams and heads and nobody is going to always get it right. If they are, then let us know their names because that's, that's quite spectacular. So that is why you have these external partners. You have these, um, you know, we, we run a primary network, a secondary network. We've got teachers who are, are seconded, if you like, but given time to kind of support you as Anna peers. Annalie, hands up. Yes. Annalie's in the room. There we go. Annalie, the primary network. We've got Omar Coker, who's the secondary network person, who has time to kind of say, yeah, I'll come, I'll come out and see you on a Monday, whenever, or whenever it's convenient. We can spend time, we can sit down, we can look at some of these issues. And then you can engage with other people, other partners within the hub, and we can come and help engage some of those that you're not able to reach at that time, not through any fault of your own, but just because you can't do everything. So make use of that. In a sentence, could we do something from each of us, just reflecting on the morning? Um, who's ready to start? Someone. Chris. I was going to say a small thing, just to pick up on Malachi's point about, you know, what qualifies as music making to be perceived like this is music and this isn't. And uh, just a small thing, but I was doing one of these events and my assistant was absolutely furious because he'd heard somebody say about my performance that you saw this morning. They were like, yeah, it's very clever, but he's not a musician, is it? And I thought, <laughs> and my friend was furious, but I thought, okay, that's interesting though, isn't it? That like sets up a lot about what the barriers and what the perception of like, this is music making. Like, when my dad sees my kids making beats on garage band, he's like, but are they going to play their own instrument? That's not really what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd just like to follow on from what, what uh, Chris is saying. I, I pride myself on not being a musician and making a career out of being musical and sneaking around the side. But it's I'm, I'm from a long tradition of doing that, and I was absolutely furious that somebody who used to be on my record label has just been nominated for a BAFTA because he was not the strongest musician at all. And he's but he's taken that skill of like being able to compose bit by bit. Yeah. And it's like how much more credibility do you need than being nominated for a BAFTA for your yeah. work? It's like and he will say the same thing, it's like, you know, his musical skills aren't great. But he's you know, he's he's very competent in his given field, which is like working with textures and exploring the outer edges of music. Um, and again, not somebody who's classically trained or can read music at all, but he's, he's got a career and he, you know, his, his contribution is so valid um, from doing that. And he's taken a route that like, wasn't available 10, 15 years ago at all. So it's like he is a composer, but he's not a composer that would have had an opportunity to have that career 
without having the sort of like the, the technology around yeah. him. It's, it's that that's allowed him to flourish. And I think for me, the important thing is, is is being aware that there are now a whole bunch of other outlets for this creativity that didn't exist, you know, two or three decades ago. Yeah. And that for me is the really yeah. exciting area that we work in. Yeah. Um, I would say like encourage the difference in terms of don't fear that unknown if like a young person expressing their way in it in a kind of musical style that you're not familiar with, mm. encourage it. Mm. Don't say it's wrong. Yeah. Just from what you know of your experience and it, um, you know, skills. So I just say, yeah, kind of encourage difference in young people with they express mm -hmm. music. Lisa. Um, I suppose for me, it's just always trying to remember that the word inclusion should never become exclusive in in, in the right or the wrong way. And by that I mean making music we are in a wonderful day and age and we've just seen that from from what you did at the beginning you know with with the technology what an incredible time and whether you choose to pick up an, a, a clarinet a violin a, a, an electric guitar or use assistive technology or music technology whatever you want to do is is an expression of music and and none of those should be discredited all of those should be encouraged and not one over the other if we can get to that point my goodness that's where we've got a real inclusive music offer yeah. Yeah. yeah i think um a theme that i sort of uh, keep coming back to is this idea of music belonging to you or not or music being for you or not and i think people have spoken about their own sort of uh, personal stories as well this idea that it wasn't for me it wasn't designed for me um, and I think that that is true of really all genres as well and, and thinking about sort of classical music and thinking about all these different genres as well it's it, I think it's our job as educators to make them understand that they have the right they have the um, yeah the, the right to access all of these genres and to be inspired by them or not or to respond to them creatively or not and this idea that a job of Good music education is not just about creating more musicians necessarily you might and that's glorious if you do but also that it's about creating well-rounded human beings who work collaboratively who are creative and critical thinkers who marvel at the awe and wonder of the world who are rounded humans i think in themselves whether they choose to be a musician or whether they don't and i think music education has such power to unlock real confidence in children um, that other subjects perhaps may not um, when they're taught well certainly they all should and they should all be creative when they're taught well um, but I think that music has a particularly unique power to really unlock these transferable skills in children whether or not they choose to become a musician or not in later life Great. Done. yeah yeah I'd, I'd echo everything that's been said I think that like the idea of transforming what we think of as a musician is really key to to a lot of the messages that come out today is like you know lots of people have said oh i didn't feel like i was a musician or i wasn't musical and stuff i'm really just emphasizing the idea that like you know when, when i talk to kids in school it's like you are all musicians you are absolutely all musicians and we want you to feel like you are rather than it's that something for other people so yeah i, I think those are really good messages and i just add um what was said earlier just about the idea that that can seem really daunting it can seem really daunting to get what well, so i've got to get every single kid in my school to feel completely understood um, and I think that, that the days like this and the, the music hub that you've got here is such a great support for that so don't feel like you know I've got to do all of that myself you know in doing stuff at my school I have so much help from the music uh, hub from other teachers in the school in other subjects as well as other teachers music teachers from around the city and stuff so like yeah speaking from a secondary perspective can feel like you're on your own and having to do this mammoth task so use other people to help you achieve that Thanks, Dan, and thanks, everyone. I hope that was useful. We're now going to go into breakout rooms, which is effectively the secondary um, breakout room, is what we call our workspace. So if you, um, there's going to be a secondary group in there. The primary group is going to stay in here. I think we should maybe move the chairs. It sounds like a plan. Um, and uh, the sensory room is open as well um, with Lee and Misha who's, who are going to talk us through. So if you're interested in assistive tech, sensory work, if you're in a special school and that feels particularly interesting, that would be great. 
And I know some of you will not belong to any of those um, things, and the idea is that you can choose where you go. So I'll say it one more time. Secondary rooms in the workspace, um, which is by the kitchen, primary here, and the centre room here. I'm going to wander to make sure everyone's happy. Very good. Welcome back everyone, the Music in Schools conference is just about to get lit. Okay, um, please welcome to the stage, Nat Oakes. Big up! Hello everybody, I'm Nat, I went to school in Gloucester, um, I'm not going to say which ones. Um, and yeah, so obviously everyone here is trying to get music more, I don't know, more prominent in schools and to be able to do that, it means you have to make it fun. So, every single person has to dance, and I mean it. Right, hang on. Sweet, this one is called London Town.
Why did you have to 